our first talk today um, is going to be Dr. Sean McGinnis, one of the um, first year residents who's going to be talking about ammonia levels in hepatic encephalopathy. Are they diagnostic? Hi everybody, my name is Sean McGinnis. I'm a first year resident here at Cottage and I will be talking about ammonia levels in hepatic encephalopathy. 1879, German physician Frederick von Friedrichs was quoted saying, abnormal nervous systems must be referred to changes in the blood. I attribute the cause of the blood intoxication to the complete arrest of the hepatic functions and also to the cessation of the powerful influence which the liver exerts over the process of the metamorphosis of matter. My agenda for today, I uh, just want to go and see where we are today on this topic. I'll do a brief review of the history, um, go over the pathogenesis and the key players. I'll talk about a few studies and then bring everything together in a summary. Hepatic encephalopathy is a costly complication of cirrhosis. Um, etiology is multifactorial and incompletely understood even today, but it has often been tied to ammonia. 2005, annual inpatient incidence was found to be greater than 22,000, or 0.33% of all hospitalizations. Estimated cost of greater than $63,000 per hospitalization, with an associated mortality of 15%. So where did this begin? In 1877, the first portal cable anastomoses were performed in dogs. Uh, later in 1893, the syndrome that we refer to as hepatic encephalopathy was first characterized by Nobel Prize winning physiologists led by Pavlov and Nenke in Russia. And they performed these portal cable shunts and found elevated blood ammonia concentrations observed after feeding these dogs um, nitrite substances. And by 1952 uh, was really the first studies of cirrhotic patients showing worsening neurologic symptoms correlating with ammonia levels after feeding protein or ammonium salts. Here's a brief overview of the pathogenesis on this topic. And again, there's five key players in this situation. So plasma ammonia levels are principally a reflection of the balance between ammonia producing organs and ammonia removing organs. In the past hundred years, the concept has evolved that the gut is the key producer of ammonia, whereas the liver, brain, muscle, and kidney all serve to help eliminate it. And this il illustrates the complexity of the situation. So everything really begins in the gut, where you have amino acids and urease-producing bacteria that generate the ammonia. This then travels via the portal vein to the liver, and within the liver is the urease cycle that helps break down the ammonia, forming urea, which can then enter the circulation. This can then go to the kidney to help be excreted. It can go into the muscle, where glutamine synthase helps remove ammonia. And then finally, it can also go to the brain, where we uh, see our profound symptoms. Problems arise when you have an obstruction uh, seen in cirrhosis where backflow of the portal vein leads to portal cable shunting, and this ammonia goes directly into the systemic circulation. The gut is by far the most critical component in this situation. Um, here, dietary nitrogen is converted to ammonia by enterocytes and bacteria, which then diffuses into the liver. Uh, common therapies in this situation target the gut enterocytes as well as the urease-producing bacteria. So throughout the presentation, I had these little uh, signs here to illustrate where we can target our therapies in hepatic encephalopathy. So lactulose is one of the non-absorbable synthetic disaccharides that can increase colonic flow and present absorption. And then antibiotics such as rifaximin can target the urease-containing bacteria. Periportal hepatocytes in the liver convert ammonia to urea via the urea cycle. Problems arise when portal hepatic shunting bypasses the liver allowing a buildup of ammonia. And then additionally, cirrhotic patients are often generally malnourished, lacking the amino acids required for the urea cycle. Um, here I've just showed basically a periportal hepatocyte and the urea cycle. Uh, this enzyme here, uh, ornithine transcarbamoylase, is a very rare deficiency disorder in children. And with, when that is um, abnormal, it leads to elevated ammonia levels uh, that you often see in hepatic encephalopathy as well. Ammonia, specifically the non-ionized form NH3, can readily cross the blood-brain barrier. And there's three mechanisms that lead to symptoms. First, it's directly neurotoxic by alterating, uh, alterating neurotransmission through GABA and NDMA pathways. Um, second is when ammonia enters these astrocytes within the brain, it's converted into glutamine. 
Glutamine can then go into the mitochondria, uh, generate reactive oxygen species, and cause mitochondrial dysfunction and cell death. And finally, the glutamine within the astrocytes is osmotically active and can pull water into the cell, causing cerebral edema. And this chart may be difficult to see, but it shows the three main players, ammonia, glutamine, and inflammation, which I will talk about, and how, how the three of these lead to cerebral edema, which is the ultimate end product. The kidney has shown to be both an amine, um, ammonia excreting and an ammonia producing organ. It produces ammonia via glutamine breakdown, which can release two thirds back into the systemic circulation and excrete one third. However, this ratio is often altered in acute liver failure, helping to excrete more ammonia. This is very pH dependent and patients that develop alkalosis can often have worsening symptoms. So again, that's another target to therapy. The muscle is another scavenger of systemic ammonia Malnourishment is common in these patients, which impairs ammonia breakdown, and thus nutritional status is paramount. So again, that's another target of therapy there. I've included inflammation almost as another organ system in this picture. Uh, in 2000, Rolando et al. showed that 887 patients with acute liver failure uh, showed worsening outcomes in those with SIRS uh, in developing hepatic encephalopathy. During acute liver failure, there's often a rise in inflammatory cytokines, especially IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. And these cytokines enhance diffusion of ammonia across the blood-brain barrier, causing worsening neuronal dysfunction. A few studies I'm briefly going to run through. The first being in 1963 that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. This was really the first concise study looking at this overall picture of ammonia levels in hepatic encephalopathy. While the study did show a general correlation between ammonia levels and symptoms, this was really the first instance that we see doubt in this topic. And it's quoted saying, indeed there are well-defined, even at advanced cases of cirrhosis without any increase in the level of ammonia in the peripheral vein blood after loading with an ammonia salt. This is really the first case that there was doubt on this topic. Same study, this is looking at the grade of hepatic encephalopathy on the top with plasma levels of ammonia along the side. And I just wanted to point out across all grades there are patients with low levels of, of ammonia. Ong et al. is probably the most widely cited study on this topic. They took 121 cirrhotic patients, evaluated correlation between venous, arterial, and plasma ammonia levels, and the severity of hepatic encephalopathy. And they assessed mental status using the West Haven criteria. This is the West Haven criteria that we're probably all familiar with. And this shows stages zero to four, and they look at clinical exam including consciousness, intellect, and neurologic findings, with zero being essentially a normal exam and four being comatose. So they went on to find that 69% of patients without signs or symptoms of encephalopathy had arterial ammonia levels greater than the upper limit of normal. And while there was a general correlation between the levels and severity, there was still a substantial overlap in the ammonia levels by grade of hepatic encephalopathy and concluded that therefore there, a single level has little diagnostic value. Here is their illustration, and again showing in these lower ranges, less than 100, patients even up to grade three uh, hepatic encephalopathy have near normal ranges of ammonia levels. Similarly, even patients of grade zero and grade one have elevations between 100 and 150. This study also showed there was often precipitating factors in this situation, including azotemia, infection, GI bleeding, lactulose non-compliance, constipation, and then other miscellaneous. Lockwood and colleagues summarized that neurologic symptoms are dependent on the amount of ammonia entering the brain, not the levels in the periphery. Cirrhotic patients with chronic exposure to elevated ammonia adapt by increasing brain permeability surface area, as the brain is also one of the organs able to detoxify ammonia. This allows increased diffusion across the blood-brain barrier and may explain why some cirrhotic patients with near-normal levels exhibit neurologic symptoms. They found that other factors such as benzos, hyponatremia, inflammatory cytokines have also shown the ability to promote astrocyte swelling, which explains how patients uh, with near-normal levels can have symptoms. Fabrizio et al. in 2015, this was a prospective observational study in the ICU looking at patients without acute liver failure or chronic liver failure, and they measured ammonia levels on admission day 3, 14, 21, and 28. And again, they found that 
73 of 100 patients had L levels greater than 35, which is the upper limit of normal. And only 13 of these 73 patients had risk factors. In this study, 42 cirrhotic patients evaluated by clinical exam with subsequent venous and arterial ammonia measurements. They showed that asterisks had better correlation than arterial ammonia, correlation coefficients shown, and there was also discordance between ammonia levels and neurologic symptoms, suggesting that other symptoms, other factors may play a role. I have a list here showing other etiologies that can elevate ammonia levels. This includes exercise up to three times. There's higher levels in men. Levels can increase up to 10 after smoking a cigarette, and the reference range is 10 to 35, so 10 can actually be a significant level there. Chemotherapy, valproic acid, and then other idiopathic hyperammonemia syndrome. This is a chart from UpToDate, again, just showing the long list of other things that can elevate ammonia levels. And these are some things we see every day, including renal disease, GI bleeds, shock, smoking, and then other drugs such as alcohol, diuretics, narcotics, things we deal with all the time. Additionally, there's an effect of the blood draw. Concentrations are affected by the site of collection and the analytic method. If they're not immediately placed on ice, it can falsely elevate levels by up to 100% within two hours. <coughs> Additionally, using a tourniquet and a fist clenching technique when doing the draw can elevate levels as well. Um, I've actually spoken to several nurses in the department just as, out of curiosity to see what their protocol is, and the ones that I spoke to said they are supposed to put their samples on ice, but none of them knew about using, not using a tourniquet or a fist clenching technique. So some reasons for the poor correlation between ammonia levels and symptoms. I've talked about the blood draw technique. Uh, alkalosis can also elevate levels. Uh, additionally, we tend to measure venous levels instead of arterial, and venous levels tend to be lower due to uptake by muscle. Inflammatory cytokines can alter the blood-brain barrier, allowing ammonia to diffuse more easily. Hypokalemia can cause increased renal production of ammonia. And finally, total ammonia levels are assayed rather than the unionized NH3 alone, which is the uh, particle that actually spreads across the blood-brain barrier. Here is a summary of all the contributions that may precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. And again, this illustrates the complexity of this disorder. And the point I'm making here is how can a single ammonia level measurement account for alterations in all of these processes? Again, as an illustration showing the complexity of the multi-organ systems, Again, I've already talked about how everything arises in the gut with proteolytic bacteria. You have the urea cycle in the liver, systemic absorption in the muscle, the effect of the kidney and hypokalemia, euvolemia, and acidosis versus alkalosis, and then the astroglial glutamine production in the brain and how it causes cerebral edema. This is a chart showing the targets to therapy through all of the different organ systems. So you have the gut and inflammation that we can use lactulose and rifaximin. Liver and urea cycle, you can use zinc supplementation to help with the urea cycle. Kidney, you can maintain euvolemia and eukalemia. And then the muscle via nutritional support including branched chain amino acids. So in summary, although some studies have shown a general correlation between ammonia levels and severity of hepatic encephalopathy, a single ammonia measurement is not diagnostic and not recommended. It has been shown that ICU patients without hepatic dysfunction often have elevated ammonia levels. It has been shown that cirrhotic patients with no hepatic encephalopathy can have raised ammonia levels. An ideal approach should be guided by a refined ammonia hypothesis, one that acknowledges the contribution of inflammation to the neurotoxicity of serum ammonia and underscores the importance of the gut, kidney, and skeletal muscle in achieving ammonia uh, homeostasis. Despite a positive correlation between our arterial ammonia levels and severity of symptoms in some studies, substantial overlap exists between groups, meaning single ammonia levels have little utility in the diagnosis of hepatic encephalopathy. So you're at your computer and your order sets. To order or not to order, you make the call. And those are my resources. Uh, ammonia levels are diagnostic of hepatic encephalopathy, so that's what we're going to be voting on in a minute. But first, any discussion, comments? Yeah, Joe? One of the things we commonly do is give these patients diuretics. What's the impact on the ammonia when we're giving the uh, 100 spironotic, 240 of Lasix combination to a cirrhotic patient who's confused and 
measuring ammonia of 60. Uh, when we do the diuretic, does that do any, what's the impact in that? So di diuretics have been shown in some studies to actually be a precipitant. Yeah. So diuretics are down here drugs that can also lead to hyperammonemia. So I think it would worsen the situation. Okay, and then uh, they also cause alkalosis too, which worsens it. Should we be treating to lower that ammonia level? Is that a therapeutic role that people with panic and stuff like that? So if you bring it down, does their ammonia level get better? Are there I, so most of the treatments, especially the lactulose and the rifaximin, are aimed to reduce systemic absorption of ammonia, but I don't think there is a reason to trend or follow ammonia levels, even if you are treating, because there's all these other reasons that could alter the level and cause you false highs or false lows. Well, it seems to me that's like hypotension. How many causes of hypotension? One of them is anemia, but it's not the only thing we're going to follow, but the problem is we want to follow it. It's a multifactorial problem. And again, that's, that's what makes the situation complex, is there's so much involved, uh, whereas one number, it, it might be difficult to understand what that really means. I think, I think the, you know, from my standpoint, 60 or 70 percent of critically ill patients with no liver disease have high ammonia levels. And a significant number of people with hepatic encephalopathy documented hepatic encephalopathy have normal ammonia levels. So the, the utility of this, of this test for diagnosing or even following hepatic encephalopathy is, in my opinion, very, is, ne is nil. Yeah. I think you had a graph with the high grade encephalopathy being the only area where there are the very high values. Do you think that you ought to just use a higher cut point and then use it as a more specific and less sensitive test than using Uh, so there, in general, those graphs do show a correlation. I think the co correlation coefficient was around 0 0.7, 0 0.75. Um, when they took cutoffs in the low 100s, sensitivities were maybe 70 percent, 80 percent. So, in a sense, it is can be useful, but there's also a lot of unclarity, and that's kind of what I was just trying to illustrate. I think he also showed that asterixis was a better test than any of the ammonia levels, and that doesn't cost anything. <laughs> yeah. So you think there's a better chemical marker for hepatic encephalopathy that's responsive to lactose or rifaximin besides? I, I absolutely think there's one coming from all the studies we looked at. There isn't one at the moment, but there's chemicals they've been looking at in the brain that they're starting to, to try to use, and they're also using psychometric testing that can be somewhat sensitive. That's like line dot tests, other things, but I just don't see that used clinically at the moment. Um, and then really quick, just uh, something I came across, the Medicare reimbursement rate for an ammonia test was $27, so just something to know. <laughs> <laughs> One other, uh, along that line, um, I trained at LA County uh, a long time ago. But at the time, it was one of the preeminent liver centers in the world, probably. And we uh, were basically told never to send ammonia levels. And um, what, if we really suspected that somebody had hepatic encephalopathy or hepatic coma, really, in the ICU, we would do CSF glutamine levels because it does correlate better than ammonia level, much better because that's a big part of the problem is, maybe the main problem is the glutamine in the brain. So, but obviously that's a lot harder to get than a blood test. Yeah, Dan. I don't think ammonia is billable separately for inpatients, so the Medicare reimbursement is zero. Okay. I read that somewhere. It's time to vote. Um, so how many people at this point believe that ammonia levels are diagnostic of hepatic encephalopathy? Is this confirmed to be true? Anybody? One. Uh, anybody think it's plausible still, even in spite of the evidence? No, oh, we got a half a dozen or more. <laughs> and how many think it's busted? What do you think? Busted? <laughs> Partially.